Hello, math students. Topic four is on separable differential equations, first order in particular. A first order ODE is separable if it can be written in the following way, where the derivative, which is first order, a first derivative, is isolated on the left, and on the other side of the equation, we have the the other side can be expressed as a product of two independent functions where one involves uh, y and the other involves x. Now normally, when you take a first order differential equation and isolate the first derivative, we wind up with uh, something more of this nature where you have this side of the equation involves potentially x and y both but it's not always the case that you can factor this side of the equation in such a way that the y's and x terms are separated into separate factors. Well, if you can do that, then it's a separable differential equation. So determine whether each ODE below is separable. We're going to focus on this one first. The way it's written, you could split right here and say that we have one function here that's a function of x, and then one function here that's a function of y. And because they're being multiplied, then we have a separable differential equation, yes. Now, of course, you do have some freedom with this too. The two could be thought of as part of the g of y, and the two I'm talking about is this two here, or it could be thought of as part of the f of x. You do have some freedom there with how you interpret that too. Uh, the next one. This plus 1 turns out to be troublesome. I can't think of a way that we could factor it, this overall expression so that the y's are entirely pulled out of there or the x's are entirely pulled out of there. So if I try to factor out a y, then I wind up with a 2x squared plus 1 over y times a y. And so this isn't only x's. There's x's and y's still. So I can't call this one f of x and this one g of y because of the y's are present still there in that first one. It turns out this one is not separable. So we're just going to say no here, not separable. Third one. Now this has a y and a y in both terms, so you could factor out that y and rewrite this as y prime equals 2x squared plus 1 with the y factored out, and now you have that split that we're referring to. So split right there. We have a f of x here and a g of y over here. So the answer to this one is yes, separable. And uh, the last case here, I do have x squared that can be factored out. So I can take all the x's out of, the, out of this term, and we would wind up with y prime is equal to parentheses 2y plus 1. There we go. 2y plus 1 with a factored x squared out to the front. And you can think of this one as separated. Here's, a, here's my g of y function here, and here's my f of x function. It doesn't matter which one is written first because multiplication is uh, commutative. But the answer here is yes. I don't want that gone. OK. Uh, let's see. We're moving on. Separable ODEs can be solved by the separation of variables method shown below. Okay, so we're going to do this first case here that we said, what is happening here? I keep hitting the wrong buttons. First case right here is y prime equals 2x squared times y. We said that was separable. And the method of separation will be the following. I'm going to rewrite the y prime in using Leibniz notation dy dx. Then I'm going to separate the variables, getting all the x's to one side and all the y's to the other side by a multiplication or division. It has to be multiplication or division to isolate the terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by y and multiply both sides by dx. When I divide both sides by y, I get dy over y is equal to, and multiply both sides by dx, 2x squared times dx. So we have 
we effectively get it to the form where we have some sort of function of y over here times dy equals some sort of function of x times dx. This is the form you want to get it into. And of course, this looks like dy divided by y, but you can think of that instead as 1 over y times dy. So there's my function of y times dy. So function of y times dy equals function of x times dx. And now what we do is integrate both sides with respect to those variables. So the left side we integrate with respect to y. We treat y as the independent variable as far as this integration is concerned. And we get the natural log of the absolute value of y. And the right side, when I integrate it, I get 2x cubed. Now I, I need to 2x cubed all over 3. Now I need to get uh, plus c needs to surface here when we do the antiderivative. It should surface on both sides, but you can combine the two plus c's into one plus c on the right side only. So plus c needs to surface somewhere here. Now this is considered to be an implicit uh, solution. And it's general. General because of the C is still not solved. Notice there's no uh, extra data here for this ODE to allow me to find C. So the best we can do is find a general solution. But this one's called implicit because we have not yet solved for Y. Once we solve for Y, then we will have an explicit form for our uh, solution. Now, to find an explicit one, we, we must continue working to isolate the y. So I'm going to copy this here and bring it up and do some more work. OK, to get rid of a natural log, we maybe have to do a little bit of uh, re reminders about how to work with uh, logarithms and exponents. So let me over here on the side just put a few different things here by way of review. If ever you have a, a natural log of a is equal to b type of expression, then you can exponentiate each side. In other words, do e raised to each side. And then we can use the property that e raised to the natural log are inverse functions of each other and cancel, and you get a is equal to e raised to the b. All right, here's one thing to remember. Another thing that we're going to be using here in a moment is just re take a quick review about exponents. If you do x cubed times x, sorry, x squared times x cubed, we know we should um, add the exponents to get x to the 5. But in general, if you have x raised to a sum, you can do this backwards and write this as x x raised to the m times x raised to the n. And then, of course, another, by way of review, another thing to remember is that if the absolute value of x is equal to 2 and we're solving for x, then x can be one of two things, plus or minus 2. Right, keep those in mind as we move forward here and try to solve for y. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to exponentiate to each side. I'm going to do e raised to each side. The e and the natural log cancel, giving an absolute value of y is all that's left. And then on the other side, we have e raised to the 2 thirds x cubed plus c. From here, I'm going to, I recognize I have a, a sum and an exponent right there, so I'm going to break that apart using this property. If you have a sum and an exponent, you can write this as a product of two different exponential statements. So we have absolute value of y is equal to e to the 2 thirds of x cubed times an e to the c. And then to get rid of the absolute value, we get plus or minus. And I'm going to put the e to the c in the front. And we wind up with this expression here. Now, since c was arbitrary, 
e to the c is going to be an arbitrary positive number. And with a plus or minus in front of that, we get just an arbitrary coefficient out of all this. So it's common to take that plus or minus e to the c and just call it another arbitrary constant. You can use a c again. I'm going to use an a. It doesn't really matter what letter you put there, but usually a capital letter to stand for the unknown constant. And then here we have a general solution that's explicit. So just the key, the, the key differences. As soon as you do the antiderivative of both sides over here and got this result, then we're considered that we are at a solution. But it's an implicit solution because y is not yet isolated. When I did, took the extra steps to get y isolated and write it like this, then we have an explicit general solution. Now both of these are general because the c hasn't yet been, been determined, and in this case the a hasn't yet been determined. Um, and we don't have data here in this problem to determine those. So we, we're going to stop this problem here. Okay, let's move to the next one. Solve the ODE and use technology to confirm your answer. I'll be using Wolfram Alpha to confirm the answer, but let's, first let's solve this by hand. You'll notice this is actually just this last one over here, rewritten, except using T instead of X. We're just repeating that one. This is separable. We just got to factor out the t squared. So I'm going to write this as dy dt equals, if I factor out the t squared, I'll have a 2y plus 1 times a t squared. Then multiply the dt to the other side and divide the 2y plus 1 to the left side. So we have 1 over 2y plus 1 dy is equal to t squared dt. And now we integrate both sides. Move this over slightly. OK, we may need to do a substitution on this one here. If, if you do a substitution and you let uh, u be that 2y plus 1, you're going to see that the, the, the du will be 2dy. So dy is equal to du halves. So this winds up really just being 1 over u times du halves, and the antiderivative there is natural log of u times a half. So we get 1 half natural log of u, absolute u, and u is 2y plus 1. So we had to do a substitution there to finish that integral. The other side of the equation is a rather straightforward integral integral of t squared is just t cubed over 3. And then, of course, we need the plus c. And right here, we have our implicit general solution. I should mention at this point, too, that when you do your homework online, your homework is going to have you effectively stop when you get to these points here. They don't have you go all the way to get y isolated, which I think is unfortunate. I would personally practice, when possible, after you get your general solution that's implicit, that you take your solution to an explicit form if, if possible. Even though your online homework will have you to stop right here and enter that in as an answer. Okay, now we know that y of 0 is 3. So I could determine what c is from my implicit general solution. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let's copy this. Paste it up here. And then plug in the information we have about 0 and 3. So y will be 3 when t is 0. So this gives us 1 half natural log, plug in a 3 for y, that gives me a 7 in there, the absolute value of 7, just 7, and t is 0, so 0 plus c. So that tells me that c is 1 half natural log 7. So an ex a, uh, implicit particular solution is going to be 1 half natural log of 2y plus 1 is equal to t cubed over 3 plus 1 half natural log of 7. 
and this is our implicit particular solution. Even though we're, our instructions don't say to do this, I'm going to go ahead and graph this the way I see it uh, on Desmos. So we have one half times the natural log of, I'm already forgetting, of absolute value of 2y plus 1. Okay, so we've got to get some absolute value bars in here. Now when you bring up the symbols, where are the symbols? More symbols, more symbols, where are we at? Well, here's an absolute value expression right here. Absolute value of 2y plus 1 plus 1, and then equals, it was 1 third of t cubed, 1 third, and then go over. We need t's here. Uh, I'm going to use x instead. I, I'm not sure that Desmos, well, we could experiment. Let me try t cubed and see if Desmos will be happy with. I don't see any graph happening right now, so I'm worried that this is not going to do anything for us. 1 half natural log 7. natural log of 7. And notice what this is saying. Use parentheses around the argument of ln. Oh, okay, that's what it, it wants us to do. So let me put some parentheses around that. That didn't seem to uh, help anything. Let's see what else it says now. We only support implicit equations of x and y. Yes, there it is. So we have to make sure that we don't use t if you want to see a graph using Desmos. So we got to delete that and put an x. Okay, there it is. Here's our implicit uh, answer. Notice it's not a function of x. It does not pass the vertical line test. And that's okay. Solutions to differential equations don't necessarily have to pass. Uh, they don't have to be functions of the input variable. But sometimes we, are, we want a function of the in input variable. Now keep in mind that we wanted our point to go through 0, 3. So 0, 3 is right there. If I insisted on finding a function of x that went through this, then you can see by the symmetry here that I would really just want the top half of this. Now let me show you how getting the explicit uh, answer, particular solution, is going to give us just a, a function of x instead of this non-function of x that we're seeing here. Okay, so there's all of this work here was to get a particular... Uh, let's see, what do I want to do next? I want to... Let me kind of segment my work into parts here. Now I'm going to find the explicit general solution. So I'm going to take this and try to solve for y. I'll begin by doubling both sides. So we have natural log of absolute 2y plus 1 is equal to 2 thirds of t cubed plus 2c. Now when you double c, it, it, you can absorb constants into it and call it a new c. Keep in mind though that this c is not the same as this c. This just stands for all possible constants. So if you find that this c needs to be 7, then don't assume that that one is going to be 7 as well. Uh, now I'm going to exponentiate both sides. So we get absolute value of 2y plus 1 is equal to e to the 2 thirds of t cubed. And then there's a plus c here, but I can write times e to the c instead. And then I'm going to remove the absolute value by getting plus minus, And I'm going to call the plus minus e to the c just a again. So we have some constant in front of e to the 2 thirds of t cubed. Now I'm going to subtract 1 and divide by 2. Now subtracting 1 and dividing by 2, dividing a by 2 is just going to make a new arbitrary constant. So a divided by 2, you can just keep a. But after you subtract the 1 and divide by 2, that will be a half over there. So this here is our explicit general solution.
Now let's find an explicit particular solution. So now we're going to plug in a 0 for t at the same time I plug in 3 for y. So let's do that over here. We get 3 equals a e to the, this will just wind up being 0 there, e to the 0, which is going to be a 1, minus a 1 half. So we just have to add 1 half to this side, and we get 7 halves equals a. Therefore, our explicit particular solution will be 7 halves e raised to the 2 thirds t cubed and then minus 1 half. And this is an explicit particular solution. Go to Desmos and graph that. I'll make sure I remembered it. 7 halves e to the, okay, I think I got this. Let's go y equals 7 halves times e raised to the, it was 2 thirds of t cubed. I'm going to use x instead of t, so it's going to be 2 thirds over of x cubed over, 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 okay, and then minus one half. Okay, and here is our result, the green one, which sort of makes me realize that the red one didn't actually ever come to a corner. It looks like the red one there is some sort of mirror image happening here, and we have an asymptote occurring at height negative one half as we go off to the left. Let's go ahead and hide the red one. So Desmos wasn't able to, when I told it to graph this implicit, it seemed to get glitchy around here around the asymptote. Yeah, there's definitely a, some sort of glitch happening there. Desmos isn't the most robust mathematical tool, but it's, it accomplishes our purposes. So here's the function of x version solution of our differential equation. It goes through the point that we wanted. Now let's see what Wolfram Alpha has to say when I say solve this differential equation. I've already typed it in. You, let me just open it. So I typed in solve y prime equals 2t squared times y plus t squared, and then comma y of 0 equals 3. So you can input the initial condition as well into Wolfram, and when you hit enter, it gives you a solution. Now notice the solution it gives you. It gives us the explicit solution, not the implicit one. It gives us the one that's a function of t, which is if you distribute that 1 half there in the result, it would be 7 halves e to the 2 thirds of t cubed and then minus 1 half, right, which is exactly what we got uh, right here as our final answer. Now, personally, I like to take it and give fun answers that are functions. I, I like to solve my differential equation by finding a function that meets the conditions. And so the thing I've boxed off would be uh, the function that does it. This statement is more general, and uh, it's an implicit equation, and sometimes implicit equations don't produce functions when you graph them. It's not always the case that they don't produce functions, but in this case it did. It, it produced a graph that failed the vertical line test, and I don't consider this differential equation resolved until I find a function that satisfies it. But you can go either way depending on the application that you're trying to use that this differential equation applies to. For the purposes of our note taking, I will be finding explicit solutions. But when you do your homework, again, I wish I could change this about your online homework, your homework is going to have you stop at implicit, either the implicit general or the implicit particular. And then you'll get full credit but you should go for explicit versions 
in as much as you are able to. Okay, the next one. This next one is actually a version of one we saw in a previous lecture that we figured out what the solution to the differential equa equation was by guessing and checking. But now we're going to show how you can use separation of variables to get the answer. So I encourage you to look back at a previous uh, assignment, previous notes. We've already figured out this solution. I'm going to first divide everything by 4. So we have w prime is equal to 2w. Now notice there is, this is a, uh, the word is autonomous first order differential equation because this side of it does not explicitly reveal what the independent variable is. In other words, there's only w's on that side, w's and constants, no other variable. So it's up to us to decide what letter we want to use for our independent variable. And I should also mention that, that all autonomous differential equations are separable. Because you just have to divide both sides by 2w, and you have the w's separated. Well, this w prime, we, we get to invent, we can write it as dwd something, let's say dx equals 2w. This is certainly separable. I'm going to choose to divide only by the w and leave the 2 over on the other side. So 1 over w dw equals 2 times dx. I, I do that this way. I leave the 2 over there because if I brought it down here, then that would complicate my antiderivative. Or I'd have to pull it off as a 1 half and then just do the antiderivative of 1 over w. But I'm going to just leave the, the 2 um, over on that side. It seems like it just makes things easier. And then I'm going to integrate both sides. So integrate and integrate. We get a natural log of absolute w on this side, and on the other side we get a 2x plus c. This is your explicit solution, where you would, would uh, but it's general. So then you would want to find c next by plugging in uh, 0 and negative 5. I, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'll find the c here. If you plug in 0 for x and negative 5 for uh, w, you can see why it's important that we have this absolute value, because you can't do log of a negative. And we wind up getting that c is equal to the natural log of 5. So your explicit, sorry, your implicit particular solution will be natural log of w is equal to 2x plus natural log of 5. And I think furthermore, your homework wants you to have the constant isolated. So when you enter this answer in your homework, you would enter this. Just subtract the 2x back over and say, type this in, and this would give you uh, full credit on the homework. But I'm not satisfied with that, stopping there anyway. I'm going to take our general solution right here and first make it an explicit general solution by solving for w. So we have, I'm going to exponentiate both sides, so we get absolute value of w is equal to, the other side will be e to the 2x plus c, where the plus c is part of the exponent. Then you can break that apart and say e to the 2x times e to the c, get rid of the absolute values, that gives you the plus minus e to the c times e to the 2x, and then once again, you can just call that an arbitrary constant in front. Now, if you recall, this was the exact same uh, solution to this differential equation we were able to determine by guessing and checking. And now to find the explicit particular solution, plug in 0 for x and negative 5 for w. e to the 0 is 1, so a must be negative 5. So our particular explicit function is negative 5e to the 2x. And this is what I would say is our particular solution. It's also explicit. I wish that the online homework would make you go this far and express your answer this way as well. But they will give you credit when you stop here. I encourage you also to use some of the tools we learned last time. You know, type this 
differential equation right here into your the d field dot jar program and look at the direction field and then input 0 negative 5 as your starting value and see what solution is graphed and when you see the curve that it produces it's the graph of this function right here Okay, another case. Here's another, I'm including this one here in today's lecture because we figured out by trial and error what the solution to this differential equation was as well, with the same initial condition in a prior lecture. It was in uh, topic number two, which is where the last one was as well. So go back to topic two and you'll see that we, did, we solved this one by guessing and checking, but now we're going to solve it by separation of variables. So I'm going to subtract the q squared over. So we have q prime is equal to negative q squared. Notice this is autonomous again. There's no other letter here to indicate what the independent variable is. And all autonomous differential equations are, in first order, are separable. So you just got to divide by the q squared now. We're going to change the q prime to dq, d, and d whatever. We'll say dx again. I'm going to divide by the uh, you can divide by the negative q squared or just by the q squared, whatever you think is going to be uh, easier. I'll just divide by the q squared and multiply the dx up with this negative. And once you get it into this form, then you can integrate both sides. Antiderivative 1 over q squared. That's not natural log of q squared. Be careful. You want to think of that as q to the minus 2, and then you do your reverse power rule. So we really get negative 1 over q is the antiderivative of 1 over q squared. And on the other side, we get just negative x and then plus c. Now, there's a lot of negatives floating around, so I'm going to just multiply both sides by negative and write this as 1 over q equals x. Now, you could say minus c, but c is an arbitrary constant, so it absorbs negatives as well. You can just say plus c again. And this is your explicit solution. Sorry, implicit solution. It's not explicit yet because we haven't solved for q. If you were trying to get credit on the homework, I believe you would enter, you would subtract that x over and say that's equal to c. And this would give you full credit. Either this or this version of it. One of those. But we're not going to do any of that. In fact, I'm not going to stop here. I'm not going to find c at this point. I'm going to keep going until I get an explicit. So there's only one step left, and that is to invert both sides. So q is equal to 1 over x plus c. And this is our explicit general solution. Now we're going to find the particular solution. So plug in negative 2 for q at the same time that you plug in 1 for x. And then multiply both sides by 1 plus c. So we get negative 2 minus 2c is equal to 1. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides and add 2c to both sides and then get c is negative 3 halves. So my final explicit particular solution will be q is equal to 1 over x minus 3 halves, which if you want, you could multiply this by 2 over 2 to get rid of that fraction within a fraction and write this as 2 over 2x minus 3. Now again, I'm not going to do this here in our lecture, but I encourage you to uh, solve for q prime here. In other words, type this one in right here type it into your d field dot jar, make a direction field, and then enter this as your initial condition, and then the graph that will be produced, which follows the direction field, will be the graph of this function that you see right here. Okay, just making sure I'm circling my answers, and now let's keep going forward. Solve the ODE and use technology to confirm your answer. I, I've stopped confirming that these are the correct answers as well. I'll leave that to you to use like Wolfram Alpha to check your work on your own. Now this one here, this one will be a little bit tricky. We have the V prime, it's not yet isolated. I could divide both sides by radical T. Let's do that first. V prime is equal to 4 minus V squared all over radical T. This is certainly separable because instead of, you can separate it in this way times 1 over rad t. 
So we have a function of v times a function of t. So it's separated by multiplication. It'd be something like this. But I, want, I need the v's now on the other side. So I'm going to have to divide both sides by 4 minus v squared. So we have 1 over 4 minus v squared dv is equal to 1 over radical t dt. I also took the liberty of changing that v prime to a dv dt in my head and then separating those differentials as well. Let's move that over slightly. Let's move all this down slightly. And now I just need to integrate both sides. Now the challenging thing will be to find this antiderivative on the left. The antiderivative of 4 minus v squared. This can be done by doing a partial fraction decomposition or a trig substitution. I leave it to you to decide which one you would like to do. It's If you're to do a trig substitution, you would want v to be 2 sine u. And this will get get you through to an answer. I think I would rather set this up as a partial fraction decomposition, though. So I'm going to do a little bit of work. I'll do my work up over here. And I'm going to factor 4 minus v squared. That's going to be 2 minus v times 2 plus v. And put a constant above the two factors separately. 2 minus v is linear, so put a constant above it. 2 plus v is also linear, so put just an unknown constant above that. And then we multiply both sides by the denominator, which is 2 minus v times 2 plus v by the original denominator, which is also the least common denominator. And when you distribute that and simplify, we wind up getting the following. That 1 must be equal to a times 2 plus v plus b times 2 minus v. At this point, we have options. I could distribute the a and b and equate coefficients on the left and right sides. For example, there's 0 v's on this side, so whatever the coefficients of v on this side are, they would have to add to 0. Or we can do this idea, in this case, we can let v be specific choices so that one of these two unknowns, a and b, will cancel. I'm going to do that route. I'm going to let v be equal to 2 and plug 2 in for all the v's. So we get 1 is equal to 4a plus 0. So in other words, a must be a quarter. Now I'm going to let v be equal to negative 2. That should cancel the a, but leave the b. So we get 1 is equal to, the a term will cancel, and we get 2 minus negative e, we get 4b, positive 4b, which tells us that b also has to be 1 quarter. Okay, I'm going to uh, keep this work here separate. Now let's come back over here to the antiderivative. Okay, we haven't anti-differentiated yet. All we've done is uh, decom or did a partial fraction decomposition so that we could anti-differentiate. We want to integrate 1 quarter over 2 minus v plus 1 quarter over 2 plus v. dv is equal to, and the other side can be written as t to the negative 1 half dt, and then I'll do a power rule on that one. Now I'm ready to do an anti-derivative. So we get 1 quarter natural log absolute value of 2 minus v. If you differentiate this, you're going to get, the chain rule is going to give you a negative 1 quarter over 2 minus v. So we, we need to reverse the chain rule and put a negative here to counter that. Let's double check. Also, a, a u substitution on this will reveal that you need to have that, that extra negative out there plus 1 quarter natural log absolute 2 plus v is equal to, and then the other side, increase the power by 1 divided by the new power. It's just going to be 2 times t to the 1 half, which is 2 radical t, and then plus c. Okay, now, to, to finish this one out, it's... To put this in an explicit form, it is doable. For your homework's sake, 
effectively stopping here is going to be adequate. I think you're going to have to subtract this term over to get the C by itself when you're doing this in the homework. And they're going to call that as an acceptable general solution. And to find C next, you would uh, plug these in to find a particular solution to find out what C is. I'm debating right now whether we're going to keep taking this to find an explicit or we're going to satisfy ourselves with this implicit. We're going to satisfy ourselves with doing this one with an implicit answer. So I'm going to plug in 4 for, for t at the same time I plug in 3 for v. So we get negative 1 quarter, natural log, plug in 3 for v, that gives me a 2 minus 3, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, absolute value of negative 1 is 1, so we have a natural log of 1 here, that's going to wind up zeroing out, natural log of 1 is 0, plus 1 quarter, natural log, 2 plus v, v is 3, so we have just a natural log of 5 there, equals 2 times uh, square root of t is, t is 4, so square root of that is going to be 2, times another 2 is 4, plus c, and then we can see that c is equal to we're going to want to subtract 4 from both sides, and c is equal to 1 quarter natural log of 5 minus a 4. Remember, this, this one here is zeroed out. So we'll content ourselves with a final answer that's uh, implicit, not explicit in this case. I do challenge you to try to find an explicit one for this one, though, and we'll do that on your own time. So we have... A final answer, um, let's see, I'm trying to be smart with my space here. Let me put this work over here that helped me find what C was, and then I'll put my final answer right here with the correct value of C in place. And that C was 1 quarter natural log of 5 minus 4. We'll call this one our final answer. This one, though, is implicit. It's an implicit particular solution. Okay, and finally, solve the ODE and use technology to confirm and graph your answers. Okay, so this time I gave you a little bit of space to put some graphs in here. Let's begin by solving this uh, ODE. I'm going to multiply both sides by Y. It looks like that's all I need to do. And think of this y prime as a dy dt. I know it's t because there's a t here. And when I multiply both sides by y and both sides by dt, I simply get y dy is equal to 2 sine t dt. And I differentiate both sides next. So do an integral and an integral. And we get 1 half y squared equals negative 2 cosine t plus c. And we, we could stop here and call this our implicit function. In fact, let's go ahead and graph the implicit function, even though the instructions don't have us graph that. And then we have that plus c arbitrary comp component in there. Let's see what happens here when we type that in. So we had a 1 half of y squared is equal to negative 2 times the cosine of x and then we had a plus an arbitrary constant c and they ask for a slider for c okay so look what's going on here this is a fascinating it's not a function of x as you can clearly see and as c varies as c is, takes on different values Notice when c is negative, we just have some problems here. Ooh, and we have sort of the circles that explode into these waves, both top and bottom. So some c's look like they're, they're not even possible. So interesting possibilities going on here with our implicit, our implicit general solution. We've got to figure out what c is specifically. In fact, what's the, in the first case, we have case 1, y of 0 is equal to 2. So I'll go back here. I'm going to plug in that point 0, 2. 0, comma, 2. 
and see if I can just toggle C until I get a solution that actually intersects that point. Right? So I'm going to just mess around with C, and it looks like somewhere around here, right, we're going to have when C is about 3.9 roughly, maybe 4 exactly. I don't know. Let's try it. Let's just plug in a 4 for C, see if that appears. It appears to be it. It appears to be going through our point there. So when C is 4, we have a particular solution that goes through uh, the point we want it to go through. But it's not a function of x. It fails the vertical line test. So if you're looking for a function that passes through that point and not this non-function that we're seeing here, then we're going to want to go explicit with our answers. Can't stay implicit. So I'm going to keep going until I get an explicit one. So again, if I stop here, this is an implicit general solution. Keep going to solve for y. So I'm going to double everything first. So we get y squared is equal to negative 4 cosine of t, and then plus c. The c absorbs the doubling. You can just call it a c, although it's a new c. Uh, and then take the square root. So y is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative Let's put the c first, why not? We'll say c minus 4 cosine t. And notice it's the plus minus that's giving us the, the possible answers, the above and the below that we were seeing um, in the other problem. You can also see why certain choices of c are going to be problematic. For example, if, if c is 0, then we're trying to integrate negative 4 cosine t. We're going to have some, some problems here for different values of t. If c is negative 20, then we definitely have only negatives inside this radical, and therefore we won't have a graph at all. So certain values of c, this is going to be problematic. But we've got to determine what value of c we want in order to satisfy this condition right here. So case 1, y of 0 is 2. Knowing that we want to get a positive y-coordinate out of this. That tells us whether we should keep the plus or minus. We're going to keep the plus. It's the only way you can get a positive y-coordinate out of this function. So we're going to start with y is equal to the positive radical of c minus 4 cosine t. And plug in 2 for y and 0 for t. Get c minus 4 times cosine 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so it's 4 times 1. And square both sides. Next, we get 4 is equal to c minus 4, and then add, so we get 8 is equal to c. And so our explicit answer will be y is equal to square root of 8 minus 4 cosine t. Now, before, so here's our particular solution right there explicit as well. If you recall, looking at the Desmos, oops, just experimenting, bring it back, here we go, we said c had to be 4 to go through that point. Well, the c that was in Desmos is not the same c that we're working with here. It was this c. But remember when I doubled both sides to get rid of that one half, and I just kept this c? In reality, this c here is, should be twice this c. That's why we're getting 8, but 8 is this c. I know that's confusing, and uh, it, it's just sometimes people do something like this. They'll put a C1 here, but then a C2 here. Because once you change one arbitrary constant to another, and then later you find out that C2 has to be a certain number, then you should not change C1 to that same number either uh, as well. So there's definitely some room here for uh, misunderstanding. But let's go ahead and graph this y equals square root of 8 minus 4 cosine t. y equals square root of 8 minus 4 cosine, and I'll use x instead of x, and notice what it gave me. It gave me the, the top half of this non-function. It gave me the, the appropriate half that's going through the 0, 2. So if I only want to figure out what that function is, that's actually going through 0, 2, and I want it to pass the vertical line test. This is why you got to go with the explicit answers here, and the one that I have boxed off uh, sitting right here. This is our explicit particular function that goes through 0, 2, and which satisfies this differential equation. You know, in fact, I would leave it to you to 
test this, you know, do the derivative of this and see if you wind up confirming that this differential equation is satisfied. Uh, case two is just a different initial condition, but this time the output is negative. Knowing that I want to get a negative y coordinate, I know which of these two I should keep if I want just a, a single function. I should start with the y equals negative radical of c minus 4 cosine t. Start with this one. Plug in negative 1 for y. At the same time, I plug in pi for t. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so these negatives can cancel safely. So we get just positive 1 is equal to a radical, and we have c. This will become plus 4 because cosine of pi is negative 1. Square both sides, and then subtract 4. So we get c is equal to negative 3, and so our explicit particular solution that's a function that will go through this point is y is equal to negative square root of negative 3 minus 4 cosine t. And this is the one I would say is our, our answer. Let's go back to Desmos. Let me just copy this one, and then make some edits. Negative there, delete that, and make that a negative 3. There we go. And you're getting uh, that curve right curve down here, which is a, a disjointed curve. Let me hide this point here and put instead, let me copy, put instead the point we want to go through, which is pi comma negative 1, and make it visible. OK, so there's pi negative 1. It's right there. And we were looking for a solution that went through that point. And looks like we found one. However, it's not continuous. There's different pieces of it. But this would be the, the piece that goes through the point in question. If I go back to our reveal our explicit or implicit one, hide that or hide this, and then change C, you can see what C would have to be so that we go through that point. You see, that's why we're getting these cup shapes. So C is somewhere in this area. I'm guessing it's going to be negative 1.5 because of the, the, what we saw before, yes. So we have the correct value of C needed for the implicit version that goes through the point. But you can see this little oval thing is not a function. So if you want it, if you need it to be a function for whatever reason, then you would need to solve for the Y. And when you do that and you keep the bottom half of the radical, you're going to get this function that goes through that point. Okay, now we're supposed to put both of these graphs on the same set of axes. This part's going to be a little bit sloppy. Pi, negative 1, is roughly in this area. 0, 2 was right here. And looking at our images, trying to make this look good, looks like at pi we have the peak, and we're going, okay, so we have something that looks uh, like this for one solution. You could do this a little bit more detail, do this a little bit better than I'm doing here. And then for the cup shape thing, it looks like the cup shape is somewhere after 2, but before 4. Alright, so this is a particular solution that's explicit for the, we'll call it number 1. And then here, this was our particular uh, solution that's explicit for the second set of initial conditions. Right. You could put all the little cups in here as well, but typically when, you, when you're finding a solution, you want to find the largest domain for which a solution exists and goes through the point in question. So we would really only focus on this portion of the, of the cups, on this cup here, and say this is the, the continuous function that we're after. OK, so as you can see, there's plenty of little nuanced issues here in your homework. I, I do regret that the online homework does not seem to require you to go to explicit forms for your answers at, at all. It's going to give you full credit when you stop at implicit. If you have any questions while you're working on it, 
please don't hesitate to reach out. And that ends this lecture.